Good morning, everyone. Welcome to service. It's great to see you all. It's great to have people online as well. Um, if you want to take a look in my office, it looks like someone threw a party in there. And so that was fun, a fun surprise to, uh, to walk into. So thank you for people who did that. And it's a party here because we come and we celebrate and we worship Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so we give thanks and we praise him. And so let us join together as we, as we join in worship. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for um, always being with us and blessing us throughout our weeks and our days. We thank you, Lord, for um, guiding us and being our God, and that we could trust in you and we could uh, rely upon you each and every day. And so we come into this place to give you thanks, to praise your name, to give you glory. So fill this place with your presence, fill us with your spirit, that we may indeed worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand, sit, uh, worship as you are comfortable. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. It's a cry of my heart. It is the cry of my heart to follow. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. Me your holy ways, O oh Lord, so I can walk in your truth. Teach me your holy ways, O oh Lord, make me wholly devoted to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow, it is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. Open my eyes so I can see the wonderful things that you do. Open my heart up more and more, make me wholly devoted to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. One more time.
the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Turn to your neighbors and say hi. Everyone online, drop a like, drop a note, let us know that you are here with us. Right, kids, it's time for ping. Yay, ping. Let's see what you're up to, ping. Hey, kids. Hi there, hey, Pastor Jim, Mark. How are you? Wait. Hey, kids. Hi there, Pastor Mark. Hold on a second, Ping. It looks like you got some sort of wild animal on your face. Wait, what? Wild animal? Oh no, that's just my Jesus beard that I'm growing. Jesus beard? What's a Jesus beard and why are you there on the clouds? I'm growing a beard just to be like Jesus and floating around in the clouds is just like floating in heaven. Ping, why are you growing a beard like Jesus? I didn't even know pandas could grow a beard like Jesus. It's part of my training in godliness. People say that cleanliness is next to godliness, so I tried that by taking baths all the time, but all I got was wrinkly and pruny. So I thought there must be something more to this training in godliness that Paul talks about. And so you thought growing a beard makes you more godly. Well, yeah, I saw that you were growing a beard and Andy grows a beard. So does Jim. And there are other people at the church that have facial hair. So I naturally thought that facial hair is part of training in godliness because becoming more godly is being more like Jesus. Jesus had a beard, and thus everyone has Jesus beards. And the floating in the clouds? Well, if I'm going to be in heaven with God, then I need to train for being in heaven by floating in the clouds. Just like astronauts need to train for being in outer space, I thought I needed to get used to being among the clouds. First off, training in godliness doesn't involve facial hair. If it did, what about the women of the church? Would you exclude them if they didn't grow beards? Hmm. I didn't think about that. Secondly, I think heaven is going to be far more than just fluffy clouds. I think it's going to be way beyond our imagination. Oh, good. Because I'm getting motion sick here. Yeah. You're right about one thing, though. Training in godliness does involve being more like Jesus. To be more like Jesus is to learn what he taught us in the Bible and trying to live life like he did, in the way we act, in the words we speak, and the way we love one another. You don't have to grow a beard or float in the clouds. It's how you walk each day while you're on earth. Well... That's good to know, because I'm feeling really sick from the clouds, and I think I'm allergic to these fake beards. Oh, I'd better go to the land before I throw up on someone walking below. I'll see you next week, kids. Bye! Ew. Bye, Ping. Hope you feel better. No matter how long your beard gets, you don't become more like Jesus that way. It takes, it takes walking with the Lord, knowing him, and being with him each and every day. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus, who taught us how to walk and how to love and to live each day. Help us to follow him and to love others. 
as he has loved us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen, amen. All right, it's Sophia's turn in the back today, so all you kids can follow Sophia. Well, again, good morning. There are a lot of things coming up actually in this, in this week, starting with tomorrow is the spiritual growth meeting at 7 p.m. Uh, spiritual, growth, spiritual growth members know this, but if you would like to become a part of the Spiritual Growth Commission, uh, please join us at 7 p.m. We'll be in the coffee hour room. Then on the 27th is Crosswalk Pumpkin Carving. So we'll be carving pumpkins. We'll have prizes and competition and all that good stuff. And uh, finally, next week, next Sunday is going to be a trunk or treat starting at five o'clock going until seven. Um, if you have a trunk idea or if you would like to donate candy, please uh, sign up on the, on the bulletin board in the coffee hour room or just drop off your candy. There's a box in the narthex there. On Friday, there will be a memorial service for Nancy Bliss here at 1 p.m. Um, Christy or I or someone will be uh, contacting people about food. Um, we do uh, need some people who would help with putting the food out and also being, um, being an usher, helping out that way. So if you, could, uh, if you can help out, please let me know. And that would be greatly appreciated. Again, that will be on Friday, the 29th at 1 p.m. And then um, two weeks from now is Coffee for a Cause. And um, that'll be from 10 to 1. So after, after service, we'll head down to Ironworks and enjoy some coffee and, and baked goods. And so that would be a, the proceeds from that will go to Soul to Soul. And with that... Are there any, uh, well, we did, it, did this last week and so we'll continue it again. Are there any things that you are thankful or give joy for? Nikki. Mark. Yay, congratulations. Brendan Ray. Thank you. Any other joys or concerns? We're very joyous. <laughs> this is this is Pastor Appreciation Week, month, and year. And, <laughs> and, wow, all year. All year, <laughs> yay! <laughs> and we want you to know we are oh, very, thank very you. thankful for you. We we appreciate you guiding us along every Sunday. I'm sure someone sitting here thinks oh, he's talking to me. Where has he been looking over my shoulder? <laughs> So we appreciate you, and and thank you. Thank you. Each year, there's always surprises, and um, you know, coming out of COVID has been difficult. But you all have been hanging in there, and I appreciate you all for, you know, the the fact that you guys are wearing masks, and I think that's that's awesome, even though. I know some people don't feel like they can or have difficulty with it. And uh, just each year, I appreciate just how much uh, of a loving and caring congregation you all are, that I experience grace through all this, and I experience uh, your love and support. And I am just very grateful for um, you all as the church family and you all as the congregation. So thank you. Other joys or thanksgivings? Jane. Jane. 
Jane saw a big swarm, a flock, flock is the term, of trumpeter swans on the way in. And so it's a, it's a great time to see wildlife, to see the leaves change and uh, experience, experience uh, wildlife and nature around us. So we give thanks for that. Anything else we give thanks for? How about anything that we should be praying for? Sharon uh, Mobley is going with her daughter, uh, Katie, over to the west side to Seattle to look for, uh, look about or see about back surgery for her. And so please pray for them as they travel and also for uh, results from the doctors and the uh, surgery that follows. Are there any other uh, prayers for things that we should be praying for? Well, let us pray together. Lord, we come to you with thanksgiving because you are the great God and you, and you love us and you take care of us. And so we give you thanks for that care that you, um, that you show us. That as a church family, we love and support one another and that we are able to pray for one another. And so we thank you, Lord, for uh, this time of sharing our, our joys and also sharing our concerns and prayers. We give you thanks, Lord, for, uh, for baby Brendan. And we thank you, Lord, for uh, the safe delivery and that um, baby and mom and family are doing well. We ask, Lord, that you would... Uh, continue the, the healing in Ashley and that you would um, help the, the family come together, that you would help uh, Brendan Ray to grow and to thrive and that you would uh, wrap your arms around uh, this growing family, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for um, signs of the fall as we see uh, flocks of, of trumpeter swans, as we see the leaves change, as we experience the, the rain and the wind. We give you thanks, Lord, that we can experience um, all these things, Lord, knowing that uh, you provide uh, richly for, for us and for the world around us. We do, Lord, we do pray, Lord, for uh, Sharon and Katie as they uh, travel tomorrow. We pray that you would uh, grant them safety and that you would provide um, answers and action for uh, Katie to have surgery on her back. I pray that even now that you would be healing her, easing uh, whatever pain and discomfort she may experience and that uh, all things will point to her being able to have that surgery and, and to, be, uh, to be cured uh, through the, the hands of the surgeon. So we ask that you bless them and, and, and be with them, Lord. We do continue to pray for our congregation as we go through vital congregation, that as we gather, as we listen and learn from one another, that you'd be stirring within us um, your calling for us as individuals, but also for us as the church family, that you have gifted us, you have blessed us in so many ways, that you would help us to open up the, the gateway so that we might be able to uh, bless others in this community and around the world. So all together, Lord, we lift our hearts up to you and we pray these prayers in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who taught us our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stir in me a fire that the world cannot explain. I 
come to worship you. Stir in me a passion that my heart cannot contain. I come to worship you. Hold me and break me. Mold me and make me more and more like you. I come to worship you. To love you and fear you. Draw ever near you as I worship you. I come to worship you. Oh, Lord, stir in me a fire that the world cannot explain. I come to worship you. Stir in me a passion that my heart cannot contain. I come to worship you. So hold me and break me, mold me and make me more and more like you. I come to worship you, to love you and fear you, draw ever near you as I worship you. I come to worship you, oh Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Continue to worship in the secret, in the quiet place, in the stillness you are there, in the secret, in the quiet hour I wait only for you, I want to know you more I want to know you I want to hear your voice I want to know you more I want to touch you I want to see your face. I want to know you more. I am reaching for the highest goal that I might receive the prize. Pressing onward, pushing every hindrance aside, out of my way, cause I want to know you more. And I want to know you, I want to hear your voice, I want to to touch you I want to 
Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. can move the mountains my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave So take me as you find me. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. And Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He's mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing. For the glory of the risen King, shine your light, shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen King. Please be seated, everyone. Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 16. 1 Timothy 4, 6 through 16. If you put these instructions before the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with profane myths and old wives' tales, Train yourself in godliness, for while physical training is of some value, 
Godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and struggle, because we have our hopes set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. These are the things you must insist on and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhorting, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. Put these things into practice. Devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Continue in these things. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. 1 Timothy 4, 6-16. And let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, that is, it is through your word that you reveal to us who you are and what you, you desire for us. And so, Lord, open our ears to listen for that message, to listen, uh, help us to listen for how you would like us to live, how, how to give you glory and to share your love with the people around us. We pray, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. So before we begin, if you guys were worried about that spider in the back that Jeremiah was saying, imagine um, a room full of boys and, and just Autumn being there. And Autumn being the only person to step up and dispatch of that spider. So way to go, Autumn. So with the sermon today, I actually, did you get those pictures? Okay. We'll bring that down. We'll, while you bring that down again, Christmas, interesting. So Lake Mead, Lake Mead is the lake reservoir that was formed behind Hoover Dam when, when it was built back in the 1930s. Once Hoover Dam was built, water began to fill Lake Mead until it reached the height of 100 and, 100 and, no, 1,200 feet above sea level. And it remained there for about 65 years until the year 2000, when the level began to drop precipitously. So over the past 20 years, the water level has dropped over 100 feet. The image here is a picture of Lake Mead this past summer. The light area around the rock denotes where the water level used to be. This lighter area makes a whole ring around Lake Mead and they call it the bathtub ring. So you could get the magnitude of of this where that small speck in the, in the corner there, that's kind of like a fishing boat or a tourist boat. So you can see just how, how much the water level has dropped. The next picture is a before and after picture of Hoover Dam. You can see in 1983, just how high up those things um, the water used to be. And now in 2021, you could see pretty much the whole little tower there. The drop in the level also impacts the amount of electricity Hoover Dam can generate, let alone all the other things that are downstream of it. So why has this happened to Lake Mead? And I'm done with the pictures, but you could leave it up if you want for people to look at. But 
So what has happened to Lake Mead? What caused the levels to drop so dramatically in such a short period of time? There are two reasons. The first reason is drought. The West and especially the Southwest has been experiencing drought conditions over the past 20 years. The Colorado River, which feeds into Lake Mead, depends on the snowpack and runoff from the Rockies. Less precipitation means less snow and thus less water supplying the lake. The other contributing factor there is that there has been large population growth around the Colorado Basin. Places like Las Vegas, Phoenix, Scottsdale have all grown considerably over the past two decades. More growth means more water usage, more electricity from the dam, and more agriculture. There have been many demands upon the Colorado River, both upstream and downstream of the dam. Higher demands means less water available to fill Lake Mead. So in Lake Mead, you have these two factors working with each other to neg negatively impact the water level there. Too much, too much water going out with not enough water going in. It's, it's like your bank account when your spending outweighs your paycheck and your spending level or your saving levels goes down. Now I'm using Lake Mead as an example, not about climate change or population growth, but to talk about ministry and more specifically the, uh, the Christian life. Think of yourself as Lake Mead. In ministry, whether you are a pastor, elder, deacon, Sunday school teacher, et cetera, or perhaps you're involved with local missions or public service. When you are, when you are serving, there are always demands upon you. Demands of energy, time, resources. The demands come from not only energy, ministry, but also from family, from work, from other clubs and organization that you are part of. And that's where it's not just those in ministry, but basically everyone has some sort of demands and expectation that have been placed on them. As the demands increase, your reserves, your Lake Mead shrinks. So how do we keep our Lake Meads from running dry? One of the things you could do is try to lessen the demands on your reserve. Start limiting the amount of activities that you are a part of. This opens up time for you to be yourself, to do whatever you need to be human, taking a break, doing something life-giving, to rest, to spend time with God. In order to open up some time for yourself, ask yourself the question of, whether or not you actually enjoy doing this aspect of ministry in life. As home organizer expert Marie Kondo would ask, does it spark joy within you? Is it something that you feel called to do? Something that gives you a sense of, of satisfaction? Or are you doing it out of obligation or guilt? Are you a people pleaser and find it hard to say no to another project? Perhaps take a look at what you're involved with and see what you are truly interested in and then slowly, slowly remove yourself from the rest. Because if you are involved in too many things, sometimes you are as Bilbo Baggins explains to the wizard Gandalf, sometimes you're like butter scraped over too much bread, that you're physically there, but you're not really making a difference, not adding any flavor to life. Or if we take our river analogy, take a cup of river water and start pouring it out into other glasses. When you get to the last one, all you have left is river sludge. And when, we're, when we are over involved, that's all we have to offer is the river sludge. So that's one way to maintain our, re maintain our reserves, to cut back on demands. But let's be honest for a moment. As soon as we open up a date or a time in our calendar, 
something else swallows it up. Another event, meeting, ministry, there will always be demands on you for something. So if, less, it, so if lessening the demands is, diff, is difficult for you to do, what else can we do to keep ourselves full? If we can't do much about the demands, what can we do about the supply? If the source of Lake Mead is the mighty Colorado River, running a total of 1,450 miles, spanning several states and crossing into Mexico and emptying into the Gulf of California. Over time, over millions of years, the Colorado River was the one that carved out the Grand Canyon. But the Colorado River does not start off as a strong, wide-ranging river. It starts off as a simple creek fed by melting snow in the Colorado Rockies. Drip by drip, water melts off the mountain and join the, the long journey downstream. Other tributaries join in, adding their collection of water, giving the Colorado the volume and strength as it eventually feeds into Lake Mead. But it all starts with little drips of melting snow. In church, a lot of times we are told that in order to maintain a strong spiritual life, we need to spend time with Jesus on a daily basis. We need to go to worship, study the Bible, pray without ceasing. There are a lot of things that we are told to do if we want to be a good Christian. So we get this idea that we need to make dramatic changes in our lives in order to be that good Christian. We set out to read large swaths of the Bible, make it our goal to spend an hour at least in prayer, increase our giving and serving at church, strive to become like Mother Teresa in serving the poor of the community. But unfortunately, if we set such lofty goals for ourselves at the start, we most likely will fail. And then we feel like we failed at being a Christian and we stop doing those things altogether. But the lessons we should learn from Lake Mead and the Colorado River is that filling our reserves does not begin with the big things. It begins with the constant little drips at the start. We cannot get to the bigger goals, bigger practices in our spiritual life, bigger service projects until we have done the little things. Jesus teaches us in the parable of the talent that when the servants present what they have done with their talent, the master says to those who were faithful, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. When you are faithful in doing the little things, the bigger things come, the many things will come. We cannot jump to larger things until we're capable of the smaller things, the basic things. And that's one of the things that we learn from Paul today as he writes to Timothy. Timothy is a young leader in training as he followed Paul along his missionary journeys. Then Paul sends Timothy to Ephesus to lead the churches there. So Paul writes this letter as further instructions and encouragement to Timothy as he serves as the young pastor in Ephesus. In this passage, Paul is addressing false teachings and practices that Timothy is encountering in his ministry. So Paul instructs Timothy not to get wrapped up in all those teachings, but to stay firm in what he has learned and what he preaches. And he tells him to encourage the people to do the same. Paul says, if you put these instructions before the brothers and sisters, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, nourished on the word of the faith and of the sound teaching that you have followed. He's saying stick with the basics of the word and the teachings that you know and you have followed. All from his youth, Timothy has been taught by his mother and grandmother and now Paul, the ways of Jesus Christ. 
He says, you don't need to stray into those other things. The other things are simply myths and wise tales, as Paul says. He says, have nothing to do with profane myths and old wise tales. Train yourself in godliness. For while physical training in, is some value, godliness is valuable in every way, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Now, at this point, I kind of feel like it would be great if Paul said that physical training is of no value. So I, wouldn't, so I would have an excuse not to exercise. But he says that that has some value, but spiritual training and godliness is valuable in all things as it gives us hope in our lives today and in our lives to come. It is hope that sets, up, sets us apart and that hope that helps us through the struggles in life. And so Paul encourages Timothy to be an example for the people and to continue the practices that he has already established. He says, let no one despise your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. Until I arrive, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to, exhort to, to exhorting, to teaching. He says, sure, Timothy was young, but if he sets that example, if he proclaims the word, if he continues in things that he was taught, people will look at him and see the growth that has occurred in him. He says, put these things into practice, devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. Paul is encouraging Timothy to continue with those basic, basic things of the faith, to put them into practice, to be devoted to them. And when he does, people will see that progress. He is making not only as a Christian, but also as a leader in the church. The most important thing that Paul does is reminds him of the gift and calling he has as a leader in the church. In verse 14, he says, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. As a Presbyterian, this verse truly resonates with me as it reminds me of the gift of ministry that God has placed upon my life. And that was affirmed in me when I was ordained as a minister of word and sacrament by the laying, hands, laying on of hands by a council of elders. And also reaffirmed when I was installed here as pastor. But it also reminds me of all the times that I have been part of ordaining people into the offices of deacon and elder, something that is uniquely Presbyterian. How many of you here are ordained as a deacon or an elder? Or both? If you're online, maybe write deacon, elder, or both. It's an important thing to be ordained as a deacon or an elder. You all have a gift of ministry within you that has been confirmed by the laying on of hands by our council of elders, by the session. This verse also reminds me of the gift that are bestowed upon each one of us who have professed faith in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior the gifts of the spirit. Our spiritual gifts are given to us to help build up the body of Christ. You don't have to be ordained as a pastor or elder or deacon to have those gifts of ministry. In Christ, each one of us is part of the priesthood of all believers, that you have a ministry to show people Jesus Christ wherever you go, that you are gifted for that ministry. You have that ministry as you follow Jesus Christ in your day in and day out life. The question for all of us is, have we neglected that gift? 
Have we nourished it with the word and the teachings of the faith? Or have we gone into some sort of drought? Have we gone into training in godliness? Or are our rivers running dry? Perhaps we're in a drought when we haven't nourished that gift and it has become neglected. For whatever reasons, we haven't made the effort to connect with God and we're starting to run dry. It could be the season of life we're in. Maybe we're busy in life. It could be hardships that made you question God or be upset with God. It could be a time of testing when God seems quiet and wants to see how you'll grow. It could simply be COVID. I like to blame things on COVID these days. Whatever it is, and a lot of people are in those seasons, we've been in a drought. And remember what happened with Lake Mead during this time of drought. The water level has dropped and the ability of it to meet the needs of the demands downstream has dwindled to the point where some people are, are just receiving sludge at the end. And there is less power being produced by Hoover Dam. All that's left is a scummy bathtub ring. Is that where our spiritual life is? And is that what we have left over to serve with? If that's the case, then maybe it's time to end the drought and let the living waters of Christ flow again. There's no need to, for guilt because we all go through those times. And there's no things to turn things around on a dime. Remember, it starts with the little things, the basics of the faith as Paul encouraged Timothy to pursue. That's why I like the study that we're doing on Wednesday nights, The Walk by Adam Hamilton. Hamilton walks or talks about the basics of the faith and the necessity for believers to do those things. But he's realistic about getting back into the habit of doing these things. He always breaks it down to fives. Praying a simple thank you to God five times a day. Morning when you wake up, at night when you go to sleep, and then at the three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Just saying a short thank you, God, for letting me breathe today. Thank you, God, for how I can have a bed to sleep in. Short and simple. He breaks down reading into five verses, around five verses. He doesn't even say read five verses. He says read at least or around five verses, maybe just a short section of the Bible. Something simple, something small and simple like that. It's when you start the simple habits is when you can start building on those things. When you get the, the snowball rolling, the small, simple things to get things going, and then the bigger things are added. But since we're doing vital congregations with today being empower servant leadership, the question for us today is, what are we doing or what can we be doing to help, maintain, to help people maintain their lake meads, especially when they are leaders in the church? Are we providing ways for people to be fed and trained spiritually? Are we providing opportunities for people to use their gifts downstream? It's no good to simply build up that reserve. It needs to be put into practice. And it's only when we see that in action can we tell just how much people have grown. And so are we inviting people into ministry? Are we letting people take roles in ministry? Or are we hoarding things to ourselves? Are we letting people grow and expand? Or are we ourselves squelching other people's gifts? How we go about developing, empowering, and supporting leaders in the church is something that we will have to address 
during vital congregations. Good leadership, healthy leadership is necessary for congregations to move forward into the future and be a vital congregation, not only to each other, but also to, to the community. That sounds like a big project, something big to um, undertake that, that might come out of vital congregations. And truly, it is and it is vital for us to think about. However, no matter how big it is, we still need to stick with the basics, the small things, the small drips that when added together leads to bigger and greater things. So stick with the small things, get into the habit of doing the small things and see where those snowballs take us. See where, how we can add our small things so that we can all together do greater things for God in this church and greater things in our community. Please pray with me. Lord, help us to see what small things we can be doing. what ways we can build habits in our lives that help to nurture the gifts that you have given each one of us. Whether it's turning to you in prayer or reading the scriptures, attending worship, loving our neighbors, what are the small things that we can be doing, Lord, that can grow into bigger things? And how can we pull everything together? And how can we, together as a congregation, build leadership and to sustain leadership as we look to you as the head of the church to lead us in ways that are vital, not only to ourselves, but how we can be vital in our community and to the world. We thank you for the ways that you're working in us. Continue to reveal to us your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God fall fresh on me. Melt me and mold me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, Lord, use me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me, and melt me, mold me, fill me. fresh on me. Let us stand. What are the little things that you can do this week?
what are the little things that you could put into practice? Something simple, something easy. And pray that those little things can add up to bigger things, especially when we together use our gifts for God's glory as, a, as the church family. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, smile upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Have a good week, everyone. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. And say, See